This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Dear Jesse, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, for this long table. Uh, you are VNS Resolute Americana Assistant Curator of American Numismatics. Um, you completed your PhD at the University of Delaware and um, at VNS you deal with the Americas, North and South, um, including tokens, medals, and uh, paper currencies. Um, and your, um, your dissertation will turn into a book where you are um, expanding into um, the questions like the methods used by consumers and merchants to successfully navigate the circulation of foreign coinage in the United States and earlier colonies, essentially between the 17th and the mid 19th century. So you've published quite extensively in a range of um, journals and magazines. Um, and without um, further ado, uh, you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gilles. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, the silver coinage of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, I have both a handful of coins um, that I won't hold in my hand all at once because that would be numismatically wrong, but uh, I will show them off in our uh, nifty coin camera and then also a, a good PowerPoint. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, I'm minimize that. I'm going to share my screen. There's that. Um, I'm going to hit slideshow, play from start. All right, so the silver coinage of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, I'm actually going to start a little bit before that. Uh, down in El Peru in uh, 1649, uh, I really think that this is kind of the, uh, the basis for um, uh, Massachusetts silver, the reason why it came to exist. Uh, and even before 1649, I mean, the story of that kind of begins in the late 16th century in 1589. Uh, prior to 1589, uh, down in Spanish colonial mints, um, all the different positions that were there were royally uh, appointed. But in 1589, they changed that. Uh, where a variety of mint positions were actually, you know, essentially auctioned off. Uh, and in this case, the assayer and the smelter were, were notable uh, positions that were auctioned off. And this kind of created major problems, not only for Peru, but then those problems kind of, uh, you know, went global. Um, they began debasing their coins. Uh, a lot of these positions cost tens of thousands of 17th century dollars, 16th century dollars, not, you know, not uh, change for inflation or anything like that. So they were, you know, expending a lot of money to uh, to essentially buy these positions and to get them back. One of the ways that they did it was to base to debase the coins to put more uh, copper than there should have been or less silver than there should have been. Um, by the early 17th century, there were rumors of this happening. Uh, in 1617, the crown actually admitted that this was happening. Uh, in 1648, there were assays in Spain that revealed that most eight real coins actually only had about five reals uh, worth of silver in them. So, uh, you know, probably about 60% debased or so. Um, so it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty substantial. Um, there were a few people who were eventually tried and executed for this, uh, some wealthy merchants as well as um, mint personnel there. Uh, there were other assayers from the mint that were uh, fined, not executed. Others actually fled. So it, it was quite a scandal down there. Uh, there was a new assayer brought in um, who tried to, to rectify things. Um, uh, there were global impacts of this, of course. Uh, by this point, by the mid 17th century, um, Spanish American silver, including you know, that of, of Peru, uh, was already circulating globally at that point. So on, on basically a global scale, scale there was uh, a distrust in Spanish American silver. Uh, it hampered um, Spanish war efforts because soldiers uh, started refusing these coins, uh, knowing uh, that they were um, debased or not necessarily refusing them, but requesting more than, than their face value. 
Uh, trade was affected because people, you know, knew that there was less silver in them and and wanted more. Um, eventually, by the 1670s, uh, if you look at uh, exchange rate charts, uh, Potosi mint coins were devalued. Um, they would talk about uh, Peru coins and then pillar dollars, uh, Peru dollars and then pillar dollars. And Peru dollars were the earlier uh, debased coins, and then they switched the design in 1652 to, uh, to kind of harken back to an earlier design, and those uh, had pillars on them, and those became known as pillar dollars. Today, actually, when you uh, talk to someone who collects Spanish-American currency and you talk about pillar, pillar dollars, actually talking about something completely different, uh, that's the design starting in 1732, but in contemporary documents before 1732, when they talk about pillar dollars, they actually talk about these new Peruvian coins. Uh, those coins were eventually uh, revalued. I have a little chart, you know, uh, explanation here. I'm not necessarily going to go into the details. Uh, they were countermarked, and then uh, the earlier coins were completely demonetized in 1657. Um, I, you know, what, what does this have to do with uh, Potosi? Or, I'm sorry, but the Massachusetts silver, you ask? Um, well, it's, uh, it actually had everything to do with it. But before we do that, I'm going to actually show you uh, some uh, on the coin camera here, um, a few of these Potosi coins, just so we can get a, an idea of what we're talking about there. We're waiting on the camera real quick. Oh, there, I think everyone can see it, right? Yep. So we have $3 coins here. Uh, the one on the left is from the 1630s. Uh, the one in the middle is actually one of the revalued coins with the counter stamp. And then we have the completely new design here. And I think that you might be able to see it, but this one on the left, uh, you can kind of see it in the camera. Um, in, if you see it in, in, in person, you there, that's a little bit better. you can actually see some of the copper coming through to show the debasement. Um, and then here, right in the middle, you can see the, uh, the counter stamp. Those are the revalued ones. And then uh, you can see the pillars. So these are the, the kind of transition for Peruvian coins in the middle of the 17th century. I'm going to go back to my um, to the PowerPoint share screen. All right. So what does this have to do with Massachusetts, you ask? I'm sure everyone is dying to know that question. And I actually gave a, a complete PowerPoint uh, a long table just on the uh, coins of uh, the Potosi mint fraud of 1649. So if you're interested in that as well, uh, you can check that out. And in that, I actually at the very end do go into this connection with the uh, Massachusetts Mint. Uh, today I'm actually doing it a little bit backwards. I'm introducing, you know, Potosi Mint fraud because, you know, I feel that that was the impetus for the Massachusetts silver coins. And now I'm going to focus on the Massachusetts coins themselves. So I have three quotes here, um, and they uh, essentially talk about this Potosi Mint fraud and its uh, implications in the founding of the Mint. Uh, here we have John Hole's diary. John Hole was the Mint master. If you didn't know that, you will in a little bit. Uh, he says, quote, upon occasion of much counterfeit coin brought into the country and must, much loss accruing in that respect, and that did occasion a stoppage of trade, the general court ordered a mint to be set up and to coin it, bring it to the sterling standard for finest, and so on. Uh, and this counterfeit coin, he's not talking about, you know, people in Massachusetts or, or elsewhere making, uh, you know, counterfeit coins. He's actually talking about the, the mint down in Peru. Uh, here we have another quote from 1677, uh, Robert Slew, he stated, uh, Robert Slew, he, um, uh, he wrote books on uh, international trade, on global trade, and in the section specifically about Massachusetts, he says, quote, many base new Peru pieces of eight, eight uh, which being discovered, an act was made against them that uh, they should not go for current payment. So the people into whose hands they were scattered were hereby necessitated to have them refined, and so coin. Uh, though there was much loss, yet something was saved. So here he specifically does state the Peruvian coins as the reason for the founding of the mint. Uh, and then one more, this is from 1682, 
Um, this actually comes from the, uh, the end of the Massachusetts Mint, and they actually had to, quote, beg pardon for the fault of coining. Uh, so they essentially had to apologize to the crown for, for, um, for making coins, and this was a part of the apology, quote, we took up stamping of silver merely upon necessity to prevent cheats by false pieces of eight. It, uh, if that be a trespass upon his majesty's royal prerogative, of which we are ignorant, we humbly beg his majesty's pardon and gracious allowance therein. So there's three different quotes that uh, kind of blame the Peruvian coins uh, for the founding of the mint. Um, there are other, uh, you know, the other oft uh, given reason is um, the interregnum period in England. Uh, this is, you know, 1652, we're talking about uh, in between uh, Charles I and Charles II when Oliver Cromwell was in power, and there essentially wasn't a king uh, in the traditional sense. Um, while I do feel that that gave them kind of the audacity to create the mint, I don't feel that it was the, the reason. Um, you know, these Spanish pieces of eight were uh, circulating globally. Uh, they were the, uh, the recognized, uh, you know, silver standard of the period, so to, um, uh, melt them down and restrike them into a new coin without any real reason uh, doesn't make much sense. You know, any real reason aside from there not being a king, um, it's because there was something more happening, and that was the debasement down in Peru. So these are the coins that I'll be talking about. There's essentially five different types. Uh, there's the New England type to the left, um, and then they start adding trees to them, uh, a variety of trees. Um, there's the willow tree to the, the second one. Uh, it, there's nothing in the, um, the Authorization Act that specifically states a willow tree, but uh, numismatists starting in the 1860s started to call it a willow tree, uh, and that name kind of stuck. In the middle, we have an oak tree, and then the two to the right both show uh, pine trees, and those are pretty obvious that they're pine trees. And even while these coins were in circulation, these were known as uh, pine tree coins. Um, uh, there's two different types of pine trees. There's the large planchet uh, to the left and then the small planchet to the right. And uh, that might seem kind of like a, a little bit of a moot point, but uh, I do get into um, you know, more of the differences between those two. Um, and I'll show you these individual coins as we go along, but I just wanted to, to give everyone kind of a, a little glimpse of all the different coins that we're talking about before we uh, dig into them uh, a little bit deeper and, and before I show you individual coins. So the 1652 Massachusetts Bay coinage. Uh, initially, the general court issued an order that required lightweight silver. This is the, those, uh, those Peruvian coins to be counterstamped with its true value. Uh, but did this, did, did the, this did really nothing to uh, fight the debasement or subsequent clipping that could occur. Um, so that's when they decided to uh, start actually melting them down and creating their own coins. Uh, if we can go to the, um, the coin camera here. Uh, I do have, this is a copy of one, uh, a fantasy piece, if you will of a um, Peruvian dollar that somebody added a counter stamp to. Um, none of the actual, uh, um, uh, there's none known of the actual coins and there, it's, it's up for debate if they even did do this or if they kind of decided not to do this before they made any. But somebody at some point, probably in the, the 40s or 50s, the 1940s, 50s, uh, came across this Mint Act and decided to kind of make a a counterfeit uh, fantasy piece of it. So this is what they would have looked like if uh, if the mint had actually gone through with that. So it's kind of interesting. It's you know historically not that significant because it is it's a fantasy piece. I'm going to go back to the um, that share. All right. So May 27, 1652, the mint enacted, uh, the mint was enacted by the Massachusetts General Court, and uh, they were based uh, essentially on seven-year contracts. So every seven years, uh, they renewed this contract, and they renewed it uh, a total of four times, or they uh, went through it a four, total of four times, so about 28 years. Uh, these coins were issued by John Hull. He's uh, the person who I quoted in the first quote uh, just before. He was a silversmith and a merchant. 
Uh, he's actually paid 15 pence for every 20 shillings struck, plus one pence per ounce uh, for allowance of waste. Uh, he actually became very, very wealthy throughout this. Um, this was, you know, he was, he was making a lot of money by making money, so he did well. Uh, he was already probably pretty well off by this point, uh, being a merchant, uh, also a huge landowner. So um, this is not what made him uh, wealthy, but it certainly added to his wealth. Uh, Robert Sanderson is another person um, that is extremely important. Um, he's um, uh, John Hull's assistant. Uh, there's some evidence that shows that he was actually the, the quote unquote better silversmith. He was uh, actually trained uh, in Goldsmiths Hall in, um, in England, um, but Hull was probably better known in uh, Massachusetts at this point. So Hull was named the, the mint master and Sanderson uh, was his assistant, and, and he was handpicked by John Hull. Uh, the mint building itself was pretty small. It was only 16 feet by 16 feet, um, and quote unquote substantially wrought. I'm sure you know since they're making money there, it had to be um, pretty well fortified. Uh, the land itself was actually owned by Hull, um, and uh, it was purchased from him when he left the position. So he owned it basically the whole time that the mint was in operation, and then it became. Uh, um, you know, property of the Massachusetts Bay Colony thereafter. Uh, coins were initially supposed to be square, uh, but there's an undated order uh, that changed this to round. Uh, so it would have been interesting to have square pine tree shillings, but that never materialized. Uh, also, coins were to contain a privy mark, uh, a secret mark that was supposed to be changed every few months, according to the original act. Um, this was also amended. Uh, some people think that there's uh, well, there are like misspellings, sometimes flip letters and stuff like that. And some people have tried to make the argument that those are the secret privy marks, but there's uh, nothing to, to uh, substantiate that. Uh, the weight standard was 72 grains sterling, so 92.5% fine uh, per shilling. Uh, this represented a 22.5% reduction in weight compared to English. Uh, silver coins. So every New, uh, New England shilling was actually equivalent to nine pence in England. Um, uh, the reason for this underweight, um, you know, for the underweight coinage was the hope that these coins would remain in circulation in Massachusetts and not be uh, kind of wrapped up into this uh, uh, global trade and face exportation or, or, uh, or be, um, you know, uh, legislated for money elsewhere. Uh, an individual could bring basically anything silver, not just the, these Peruvian dollars, uh, you know, any sort of silverware, any sil silver plate uh, that, that was had and no longer won it could be brought to the mint and struck into these uh, Massachusetts coins, silver bars, wares, candlesticks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the silver was assayed and melted. Um, copper was added if need be, or, or more silver was added if, if it were uh, above sterling, if it were you know, a piece of jewelry or something that was really, really fine, they would actually add copper to bring it to that 92.5% um, uh, fineness. Um, removed uh, full finest Spanish-American silver coins. So, you know, not all of the coins that were from Peru and, and also, you know, coins from Mexico City, et cetera, came in. Uh, so those were actually 93%. So even, you know, some full finest coins did get melted. Um, if you look at archeological evidence, it's actually pretty interesting because almost all throughout the world uh, during this period, you can find Spanish-American silver uh, through archaeology, uh, with the exception of Massachusetts. So they actually did a pretty good job at wrangling up all the different Spanish American coins and melting them and turning them into uh, pine tree and other shillings. Uh, these are the New England type. Um, minting likely began right around early September, uh, possibly as early as July. Um, it only lasted a, a, a month, maybe you know, up to three or four months. Uh, there's three different denom denominations. We have the three pence, the six pence, and the shilling. Uh, the striking method was presumed to be two different strikes. Uh, it was essentially a, a punch mark with the new uh, with the NE on one side and then the denomination on the other, and. Um, they do face opposite sides of the coin. So if you actually look at the reverse here, you could see this kind of rough patch. 
that's actually the other side of the NE, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, never did they have the the NE on the other side of of the of the denomination and vice versa because uh, you know they did them individually. They struck one side, flipped it over, struck the other side, and if they did it at the same spot, they would have uh, you know damaged what they had struck the first time. So it's always on the other side, and that's actually pretty important to know for detecting uh, counterfeits or copies. Um, you know, it will always be on the other side. That's not to say that all copies um, are on the on the face, you know, the same side. But uh, if you ever do see any um, that are on the same side, I would be suspicious of it. Uh, this was short lived. Um, you know, by October nineteenth of that year, they they uh, they stopped this design. So you know, a month and a half, maybe as many as three or four months again. Uh, since the design only covered a small portion of the coin. Um, they were easy to clip, you know, you can clip a little bit off the edges here uh, and still pass it off as a full weight coin. Uh, so they needed a, a, a design that really covered the entire coin. Uh, interestingly enough, most surviving specimens, and there's not that many of the three different denominations, there might be uh, maybe 75 examples or so with the shilling being the most common. Um, there's little evidence of clipping. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. Uh, it's possible that the coins that were clipped contemporaneously uh, were sub, um, uh, then melted down and struck into the other type, and uh, coins that weren't met, melted or that weren't clipped uh, weren't melted down for that reason. Uh, the um, the New England three pence is a is a super special coin. It's a very very rare coin. There's only three of them known. It's it's the rarest of all the different. Um, New England types. Uh, the three that are known, one of them is in the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, there was another one at Yale University, but this was stolen uh, decades ago, um, you know, generations ago, really, and it was actually unrecovered, which is a, is a shame. Uh, that coin has a hole in it, so if you ever see one with a hole in it, um, um, uh, it's, it's the Yale specimen. And then this piece here is actually uh, very interesting. It was only recently discovered in 2020. Um, I believe it was in a uh, like a money cabinet uh, that was in the Netherlands, and somebody was uh, removing you know the coins from it and came across this. So uh, they sure did hit the lottery the day that they found this coin. Um, you know, obviously super rare, super historically important, and um, and quite a little find. And I mean little, uh, quite quite seriously because. Uh, because it is a small little coin. I'm going to stop sharing my screen to go to the coin camera real quick so I can show you. Uh, we don't have a three pence, as you know, because I just told you where the th where three of them are. Um, we actually did get a very large donation of these coins in 1946, and a three pence did come in with that, but it was quickly found out to be a, a, a reproduction. Um, so we do have, we actually have quite a f uh, fair number of reproductions, and, and that was one of them. But it was a, a pretty faithful reproduction. Uh, I actually do have that here as well. So this is what the three pence would look like with it, but this coin here on the right is, is not genuine. But the shilling and the six pence are, are genuine. Uh, kind of just to give you an idea of, of you know, how they look. Um, you know, their their relative size to one another, and um, and uh, you know, here you could see the NE on one side. If I flip it over, um, the three is on the same side of it. So that kind of gives it away that that it's not necessarily a genuine coin struck by Holland Sanderson. I'm gonna go back to my share screen. All right. So then they switched to the willow tree coins. This is possibly done as early as, uh, um, or this was changed by the October 19, uh, 1652 Act that I discussed in the previous slide. Um, it's possible that they actually didn't start striking coins until 1654. Uh, there is also the three pence, the six pence, and the shilling. Um, 
it's not definitively known who produced the dyes. The dyes themselves, uh, Hull and Sanderson were silversmiths, not necessarily um, you know, iron workers. So who actually made the dyes? This is usually attributed to Joseph Jenks Sr. of Hammersmith, who was uh, the first colonial iron foundry in all the colonies. Um, but it's not 100% known. It's just uh, you know, circumstantial evidence suggests that it was Jenks, but we have no definitive proof. Uh, once we get to these tree coins, regardless of the tree, with one exception, which I'll show, uh, they all have the 1652 date. Um, it, some numismatists have you know, made the argument that this was because they were in the interregnum period at this time, and um, they didn't necessarily want the outside world to know that they were making these over a long period of time. Um, that's not you know, since then, people have made the argument that this was actually not necessarily the date of production, but the authorization date. And that one, um, uh, uh, um, um, exception actually shows that, and I'll get to that in a minute. So 1652 is the same date throughout all of these different coins, and it's the date of authorization, not necessarily the date struck. They struck these until the early 1680s, and they all had that 1652 date. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, a quote unquote willow tree doesn't necessarily resemble any actual uh, species of botanical species, uh, uh, of you know, any botanical species. Uh, early numismatists actually called it um, a, uh, a palmetto tree at one point. There's a few references to that in the 1860s, um, but then it, it was uh, in 1867 when um, uh, W.E. Woodward started calling it a uh, willow tree, and that name stuck. I'm going to show you real quick some of these willow tree coins. We do have all three denominations. Let's go to the coin camera. There's the shilling, the sixpence, and the threepence. So now you can see, I'll keep that one on that side. Now you can see that the design actually does cover the entirety of the, um, of the flange. So, you know, clipping is, is uh, you know, more easily detectable at this point. You know, if you took a little bit of silver off of here, it would go into the letters. Uh, so you'd be able to see it more easily than you would on the New England type. So then they switched to the oak tree. Uh, we're not really sure um, exactly when they did this. I have circa 1660 here. That's really just uh, you know numismatic kind of uh, you know lore that's been passed down over the years. Uh, since there's four kind of major types of uh, of the tree series with the willow tree and then the oak tree and then the two different types of pine tree. Uh, numismatists have always kind of uh, put those four different tree or different types into the four different uh, uh, charters that they were given to strike these coins. So, you know, people have traditionally said that every seven years they change designs, but that's uh, probably not true, especially considering how rare the willow trees are. That coin probably was not made for seven years when all the other coins are, are fairly common compared to it. Uh, the oak tree actually has a fourth denomination, the two pence. So we have a two pence, a three pence, a six pence, and a shilling. Uh, the two pence was authorized on May 16th of 1662, and all those coins have a 1662 date, not a 1652. So that's that one exception that I was uh, discussing earlier, and it also shows that it's the date of authorization, not necessarily the date of striking or, you know, or them trying to um, you know, evade the, um, you know, uh, any sort of, um, you know, pushback from the crown because by 1662, uh, Charles II was back in power. They did have a king, you know, and of course he does eventually find out about the mint, but it shows that they're not necessarily trying to hide it either. That is the authorization date and not a secret date or anything like that. Uh, quote, unquote, oak was uh, long used to describe these coins. Uh, in 1662, it was explained to Charles II that the tree represented the, quote, unquote, charter oak that the king had hidden after the 
uh, Battle of Worcester in 1651. So, you know, by 16, uh, in the 1660s, as Charles II found out about this mint, um, he was a little bit upset, upset because, uh, to say the least, uh, because, you know, traditionally speaking, coining money is a royal prerogative and not something that a colony should be doing. Uh, but it was supposedly, you know, this is probably folklore, um, it was supposedly this um, explanation that it was the, the Charter Oak that, uh, that you know, cooled them off a little bit and allowed the mint to proceed for a little bit longer. Um, once Charles II started really, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, pushing back against the mint, uh, one of the things that people in Massachusetts did was send a lot of gifts, essentially, to Charles II, especially a lot of timber and, uh, uh, you know, uh, wood for masts. Uh, which was one of the largest exports from Massachusetts already, and really is the reason why a, a pine tree is used as a design in all these different trees, because it was one of their major exports. Um, these were struck on a rocker press, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, so you can disregard that right now. Uh, again, just following this numismatic lore, these were possibly struck until 1667, but that's again following that seven year kind of timeline that probably isn't true. Um, and again, uh, their, their contracts were renegotiated on October 4th of 1667. Uh, again, uh, you know, this goes over the denominations again, uh, likely not a secret date. Uh, for the first year of striking, half of the weight of silver coined at the mint were to be of two pence. So, you know, the reason for this coin is because they needed small change. Uh, you know, the shilling was worth quite a bit of money back then. so. Uh, even the three pence uh, couldn't necessarily keep up with the demand for for small change of making change. So they made this two pence and they needed so much of it that half of the silver uh, for uh, any given year was, uh, you know, the first 50 pounds for every 100 pounds struck uh, needed to be of these lower uh, denominated coins. Uh, for the next six years, production would drop to 20 percent of the weight of the coin silver. Um, but, you know, that's still a substantial amount because they were striking quite a bit of these uh, pine tree shillings. So, you know, quite a few of them had to be this, this smaller denomination. Uh, number of dyes, we have, uh, you know, the number of dyes that are known. The two pence, interestingly enough, there's only one set of dyes, uh, but they kept recutting it. At least six times they recut them. Every time it would wear down, they would, you know, strengthen the design. Um, and even on the, the date here, the sixes, you can see uh, that they were recut a little bit. Uh, so this is, you know, not necessarily the first striking of these uh, coins, but a, sub a subsequent engraving of the dies. Um, the three pence, we know of six obverses, three reverses, uh, six pence, three obverses, three reverses, and then the 12 pence, the shilling, uh, seven obverses and eight reverses. Uh, I am going to show you these coins real quick. We do have all four of the different um, denominations here. Shilling, six pence. Here's the three pence. And then the two pence, and you can see that 1662 date as well. I'll even zoom in on that a little bit. You can see it's 1652, three pence, and then the 1662, two pence. So uh, pretty neat. You know, usually they always say 1652, and people forget about this 1662, two pence, even though they're they're not the the rarest things in the world. Uh, you know, there's definitely many more pine tree shillings out there, but um, but you know, shouldn't forget the the lowly two pence. Let's go back to this. All right, pine tree shilling. These replaced the uh, oak trees, uh, circa 1667. Again, that's going to that uh, numismatic tradition of dating these. Um, Michael J. Hodder, who wrote a lot on this series, suggests that there actually may be some overlap uh, between the two. And there are actually some designs that kind of seem to be transitional between the oak tree and, uh, and the pine tree. 
and uh, you know, there's one variety called the spiny, the spiny tree, and that's kind of like a, a, a tradition or a, a transition between the two. Um, and there were at least two sixpence reverses that were shared between the oak tree and the pine tree types. Uh, so that's uh, you know it's kind of evidence that they were possibly overlapped or at least struck very very close to one another. Uh, they did not use the two pence denomination during this, so there's only a three pence, six pence, and shilling. Uh, again, I discussed this that there are two different sized shillings: uh, the large planchet and the small planchet. Uh, despite the size differences and the diameters of the flans, they actually still weigh the same because the small planchet is is thicker. Um, the main difference between them is in, and I'll, I will show you a chart of all the different methods, but in the striking methods, um, the large planchets were struck on a rocker press. Uh, I think I have an image of a rocker press later, later on. Um, and then um, uh, the small planchets were struck on a screw press. So there is a technological difference between the two and why, uh, why they actually uh, you know, had to come up with a difference. But again, the small planchets are actually a little bit thicker in order to retain the weight. Uh, again, this is very clearly a pine tree. You know, the willow tree sometimes looks like a little blob. Uh, the oak tree kind of looks like a tree, but this is, you know, without a doubt, a pine tree. Uh, it's the most obvious of the three different types. Um, the Hull and Sanderson contracts were renegotiated for a final time in 1675. Um, the mint likely closed around 1682 when that last contract finished. Uh, Hull died in 1683. Um, I think he was, I want to say, 59 years old, so he wasn't, wasn't terribly old. Uh, and documents of, you know, by 1684, the mint is already being spoken about in the past tense. Uh, so we know that it was, it was most likely closed by 1684 um, at that point. Uh, here's the... Uh, Kind of evolving minting technology through it's pretty interesting that you get you know three to four different minting technologies through this um, the new england type of course was uh, hammer struck uh, you know but with punches instead of full dies and again they struck one side flipped it over struck the other side uh, the willow tree coins uh, are are hammer struck most of them are are double or triple struck and you get kind of funky designs where uh, if you have um, you know, the, the inner beads don't actually create a circle and sometimes create like a triangle from being triple struck. Um, the oak and the large pine trees, again, I just mentioned this, were struck on a rocker press. Here is a rocker press, um, um, an original one up top and then a reproduction one at the bottom. The, uh, that particular press uh, was made by uh, the blacksmiths down at Colonial Williamsburg, and that's uh, uh, Eric Goldstein, who is the curator down at uh, Williamsburg, operating it, and it was under his initiative that they that they created this. And he now strikes uh, 1699 uh, Virginia shillings, um, you know, on this as as a demonstration of how these coins were struck. And then again, the small pine tree coins were uh, struck by a screw press. Uh, this, I showed this slide already, but I wanted to, to show it again now that we, you know, kind of understand how they were made. Uh, you could see with the willow tree in particular, uh, you know, to the left of the date uh, um, and the, mint and the uh, denomination, you can see that it was kind of triple struck. In fact, it's so triple struck that it says 13 pence when it really should say 12 because it was a shilling, but that uh, um, extraneous uh, one is is because of of the double striking uh sometimes it's you know they're so different that they actually look like different sets of, of dyes but they you know uh, even you know if it's the same variety it could look like different varieties just because of how uh poorly they uh they were struck um the third and the fourth coin the oak tree and the pine uh, tree the large Planchet were struck on that rocker press that we just saw a picture of Eric operating. Um, and these are actually squeezed uh, just because it rocks it. You know, it's not a, a percussive um, uh, uh, mechanical event like a, like a true minting press that we understand, but kind of squeezes them out. Um, you can kind of see at the, the top of the reverse of the oak tree. Uh, how it is, uh, you know, kind of uh, worn down. That's actually on the dies and not the coin. Uh, you know, because these 
dies have to like kind of hit, you know, uh, catch the blank planchet and then suck it through. Eventually, on this uh, specific spot, it, the dyes tend to wear down a little bit. And there's actually quite a few varieties that have this worn down part here um, on the on the those that are struck by a rocker press. And then to the far right, you can see the small planchet, uh, and they were struck on a screw press. Uh, they're much more uniform in uh in shape especially because they weren't like squeezed out and um you know the rocker press kind of look um operates like those elongated penny machines that you see at carnivals and stuff like that whereas the screw press actually took a round planchet and struck it you know uh, pretty uniform and, and kept it round whereas the shapes for those struck in a rocker press can get pretty gnarly sometimes so massachusetts silver in circulation um, again, you know, one of the reasons why they uh, made these underweight compared to English coins is because um, they wanted to keep them in circulation. So in 1654, uh, they actually passed a law that would prevent them from leaving uh, the colony in any sum larger than 20 shillings. Uh, there were searchers that were actually named within these laws um, who were meant to protect the uh, the borders uh, initially in 1654 there is a total of nine searchers kind of stationed at various uh, exit points in the colony and you know even though this is what you know massachusetts look like this is what we're used to this is kind of what they even claimed in the 17th century uh, the settlements um, of massachusetts really was right around massachusetts bay so they set these searchers up you know in this area here and not far west because there was basically you know no uh, European colonists there at that point. Um, there's a little list at the bottom, two for Boston, one for Charlestown, so on and so forth. Uh, this was increased 1669 to 10 searchers and the locations were expanded um, and it actually shows the growing nature of the colony you know as people were um, you know settling further and further away from Boston. Um, they needed to kind of expand these uh, locations for searchers. Um, this is the, you know, this larger bullet point that I have here is pretty interesting. It comes from the law itself. It says, quote, all such money that shall be found or discovered in any ship, in any person's pocket, cloak, bag, portmantle, or any other thing belonging to them, uh, these searchers were allowed to, quote, break open any chest, trunk, box, cabin, cask, truss, or any other suspected place or thing where they or any of them conceive money may be concealed and seize the same. Uh, and also they or either of them are empowered to require such assistance from any constables or others as to them may seem expedient. Uh, who are to aid them upon the penalty of 40 shillings fine for every, neg every neglect. So essentially, these searchers had unprecedented uh, searching rights. They can, you know, if there was a little nook or cranny on a, a that you had on you, they were allowed to search it essentially. Um, December 21st, 1697. So this is, you know, about 15 years after they stopped minting these coins, uh, they actually resumed these regulations. Uh, these coins did circulate for, for several decades after the fact. Um, and even though they weren't being struck anymore, uh, in fact, especially because they weren't being struck anymore and there wasn't kind of a, a supply of them coming out annually, uh, they really you know, tried hard to retain as much as they could into the colony. That didn't happen, however. Uh, they did make their way out and they circulated far and wide. Um, even in uh, neighboring colonies, they actually um, had enough of a supply of them to give them value and, and legally uh, authorize them. So, uh, you know, we can see here that they circulated in uh, New York, West Jersey, uh, Maryland, uh, even up in Canada and French Canada, um, even down in the Caribbean, the Leeward Islands, uh, Antigua, Nevis. And I think that there is even uh, some of them that have been found in the Canary Islands just off the coast of Africa. So, I mean, these things really, really did circulate far and wide. Um, you know, their, their intentions of keeping them as Massachusetts silver only and, you know, all the pains that they went through to, to search people and really the pains that the, that the people being searched went through, uh, it was all for naught because they did make their way out. 
Um, the widespread circulation as far as the uh, general court was concerned uh, was not what um, not what they expected. Uh, this might seem like a success and it is a success in the fact that you know these coins were uh, accepted far and wide, but it was a serious problem that helped lead to the mint's closure. Its quote unquote success may have caused more silver to leave the colony than otherwise would have. Um, continual reevaluation revaluation of Spanish American silver to try and attract more silver was also uh, kind of you know a, a, a point for this. Um, in the early, this is really around 16 in the 1640s, they started to revalue the silver, uh, and that is what actually gave um, you know one of the reasons, another reason why they uh, chose the specific weights for uh, the uh, Massachusetts silver. Prior to 1672, it was actually profitable convert, to convert these Spanish uh, dollars into Massachusetts silver, and afterwards it, it no longer was. Uh, by June 3rd of 1675, Hull's allowance was lowered, and in 1677, just two years later, there are actually proposals to try and get his uh, allowance um, just gone altogether, and essentially for him to be doing this for free. Uh, there were political implications, of course, uh, as mentioned, Massachusetts uh, enacted these during a period of interregnum, but that was, in my opinion, not necessarily uh, the reason why they started doing it, but kind of, you know, um, you know, a time period where they were just, uh, you know, had a little bit more audacity to do so. Uh, such authorities in Massachusetts felt empowered and broadened. Uh, in fact, um, just nine days after the founding of the Mint, uh, Massachusetts, not England, but Massachusetts annexed uh, Maine as a, as a colony of it, um, of, uh, of itself, not necessarily of, of, um, of uh, England. So that's kind of how Maine entered our, you know, in the, the grasps of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, English, you know, colonies is, is by Massachusetts annexing it, not necessarily the crown. Uh, again, they felt little or no threat from the outside world, uh, specifically from the English crown. But again, if if these coins weren't problematic to begin with, with that Potosi uh, mint fraud, they probably wouldn't have begun to do this and probably just accepted the Spanish American silver as it was. Uh, again, 1660, Charles II comes back to power. Um, 1662, you know, we know by that point that Charles II knows about the Massachusetts Mint and isn't quite happy about it. Um, he asks uh, people to start writing reports um, and, uh, you know, reporting back to him on the status of the Mint and of the coins themselves. Uh, by May 1665, royal authorities in Massachusetts were asked uh, uh, for, to copy their laws. So now they're really trying to start to scrutinize uh, each of the laws that were specifically passed during this interregnum period. Uh, in the end, they requested, uh, the Crown requested 26 changes to the laws of Massachusetts, including most significantly the repeal of the Mint Act, um, because again, that was considered a royal prerogative and not a colonial one. Uh, to try and keep this right, however, they sent tribute. Again, I talked about uh, um, you know tree masts, uh, you know masts for uh, made out of logs and stuff like that. Uh, um, you know, codfish, cranberries, lots of things, just to try to appease the king and let them keep their uh, beloved mint. Uh, October of 1678, however, colonial authorities offered uh, to change the imagery on the coins uh, to a king rather than a pine tree to help try to appease him uh, even further, uh, but uh, that still didn't happen. By 1680, uh, both economical and political situation of the mint was poor. Um, again, uh, you know, Hull and Sanderson were not necessarily old by this point, but uh, in their last time that they renewed their contract, it does say, you know, for this seven years next to come, quote, if either of them live so long, which is kind of interesting because I think they're still in their 50s at this point. But uh, June 3rd, 1682, their contract expired and, and was not renewed. Um, 
that doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't give up. Uh, between 1684 and 86, there is a series of uh, letters that list objections to the reestablishment of the mint, uh, which again presumes that it was closed by that point. Now we're talking about the mint in the past tense. Um, there were people who wanted its uh, reestablishment. Uh, during this period, the the whole colony of Massachusetts actually loses their uh, their royal charter. And, um, you know, in the renegotiations to try and get that charter back, you know, one of the things that they keep fighting for over and over again is to have their mint back and reestablish and actually add it to their new charter, but that didn't happen. Um, the late 1680s in Massachusetts was actually uh, quite, uh, um, you know, uh, it was very politically, um, you know, unstable times and um, it, was, it was an interesting period. Uh, October 1, 1683, uh, John Hall dies after a several month illness. We're not 100% sure what it was. Um, uh, Sanderson lived until 1693. Uh, here we have a photograph to the right, um, a little plaque where the whole mint, uh, the Massachusetts mint was. Uh, you can now uh, be beautified there. I think it's a, a beauty boutique. Um, I think I saw Ray Williams on the call earlier. If I'm not mistaken, he was actually there on the day that this plaque was unveiled. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the history of the Mint kind of does continue and, uh, you know, it's still a very beloved um, series of coins that you know, numismatists, um, you know, continue to pay tribute to to this day. So that's the end of my PowerPoint. Um, do we have any questions or anything like that uh, that people want to uh, either unmute themselves? Uh, there are a few things in the, the chat. Uh, I have a question here. Does anyone know why they struck the coins with the name uh, Massachusetts with TH and not CH? Uh, was the TH pronounced as CH uh, in the name of the colony at the time? Uh, did the pronunciation change and subsequently the spelling? Um, I don't, I don't know, to be honest with you, uh, that's, um, you know, there were various, uh, ways to spell things, you know, it really wasn't until the 19th century that, uh, spelling, you know, be, really became standardized as we know it today. Uh, so, you know, there, there were various ways of, sp of spelling things. Uh, I don't necessarily know particularly about the, the TH and the CH, but, uh, that is an interesting uh, kind of conundrum that does happen throughout the entirety of the, the Massachusetts uh, silver. Uh, we have another question, although it was undesirable to have debased Potosi silver being used at the time when Spanish colonial silver circulate, circulated widely, would the availability of Mexico City and Lima silver offered? I can't see the rest of the question, though. Uh, the option of simply rejecting the use of Potosi silver in favor of Mexico City and Lima issues. So essentially, uh, you know, why couldn't they just stop using the um, the Spanish American or the Potosi silver and and go for Massachusetts? I don't think that there was a steady supply of uh, Mexico City. Uh, Spanish going into Massachusetts at the time uh, really um, Spanish American silver started showing up in Massachusetts around 1640, so only about nine years before the Potosi fraud and, you know, about a dozen years before the, um, the Mint Act. And their main um, method of acquiring Spanish American silver was through Barbados. Uh, the trade, regular, or trade routes with Jamaica wasn't really set up yet, so... They only had one source of it, uh, Spanish American silver, and those in Barbados were likely getting it through trade channels that originated in uh, in Peru and Potosi. So, uh, of course, Mexico City Mint did exist, but I just don't think that they had enough of its entering uh, Massachusetts at the time. I think, um, you know, due to their limited trade uh, routes that they had in the late 1640s, the vast majority of it was coming through, again, uh, from Peru to Barbados and then to um, Massachusetts. Before we get back to the written questions, we have a, a hand raised. Yes, hand raised. iPad 174. Hi, that's uh, Richard Bowson. Hey, I just how are you? 
uh, nice to uh, see you on Zoom. I just wanted to mention in regards to the Massachusetts Silver leaving Massachusetts uh, on the shipwreck of the Feversham, which sank in Canada in 1711, there are quite a few uh, pine sheet shillings and uh, even um, a willow tree shilling found. Yes, no, thank you for that because I almost show, uh, forgot to show some coins that I wanted to show. So if we can switch to the um, coin camera. We actually do have three really, really interesting pieces here uh, that were found on the Feversham uh, that, again, sunk off the coast of um, uh, somewhere between New York and Canada. Um, it was leaving New York on its way to Canada when it sank. Uh, these three pieces are extremely important. Um, they look like junk, but uh, they're actually extremely important. Uh, prior to the Feversham being discovered, there were clipped pieces of Massachusetts silver known, uh, but we didn't necessarily know their context. We didn't know if it was just, you know, somebody messing around or, you know, or whatever. But the fact that these three pieces uh, were found in an archaeological context with, um, you know, uh, in with other coins, you know, being used as uh, a piece of economy, uh, shows that these clippings were still being used as money and it wasn't necessarily someone messing around with coins uh, after they stopped circulating or anything like that. Um, so, you know, it's another method of creating small change. We talked about the three pence and, and of course, the two pence, you know, being authorized for small change. And a lot of that was probably because people were clipping the coins like this and uh, to try and get smaller pieces of silver. So. You know, these three pieces are, are um, you know, if, if they didn't come from a known archaeological source, um, you know, the, of course, they would be just damaged. You know, they'd still have some historical significance and, and, you know, some value and stuff like that because they are clearly Massachusetts silver. But the fact that they were found in that archaeological context um, really drives home this point that, you know, clipped uh, Massachusetts silver was being used as money as well. So... Thank you, Richard. I appreciate you um, making that point because I would have forgotten to show these otherwise. Um, speaking of the Rocker Press, um, we had a COAC, a Coinage of the Americas Conference here at the ANS in September. And, um, and Eric Goldstein actually brought his Rocker Press up here to New York City. Uh, that video of his talk is now available on our ANS YouTube. Uh, it's called Cranking Miss Betty. Um, so if you just go to ANS YouTube and, and, um, and look it up, you know, um, it's a really, really great uh, presentation. It was actually, you know, not, you know, disowning or, you know, talking bad about any of the other presentations, but it certainly was a highlight of, of the COAC and we had a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who were here during the COAC, you'll remember in between uh, talks, you know, we were always playing around and messing around with the press for a good, you know, five, ten minutes uh, in between. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so um, I think there might be a link actually to that now uh, in the chat. So uh, we have another question. Was Massachusetts the only colony to mint coins locally? And if so, why didn't other colonies do this also? Uh, was there a fee to convert your silver to coins? Uh, for the last, there was a fee, and that was really the um, you know the uh, the allowance that John Hull got. Um, there were no other colonies that minted coins locally. Uh, there were Maryland silver coins issued in the sixteen late sixteen fifties and sixteen fifty nine, but they were actually struck in England and then imported into uh, Maryland for use there. Um, so these are the only colonial coins. There are some others like the 1630, I'm sorry, the 1737 uh, Higley coppers. Those were minted locally, um, but I don't think that they had much of an economic impact to the degree that these uh, pine tree shillings had. Um, so there are some other exceptions, but nothing that lasted uh, this long, you know, 30 years worth of minting coins uh, that really did um, you know, fund their entire economy uh, for, you know, throughout that period. So, you know, the others, you know, the, the, the Higley is kind of an anomaly where, you know, there's, a, there's some made, not a whole bunch, 
Um, you know, a lot of them were probably melted later on, uh, but, uh, and then there's the Maryland, which did have a, a minor impact to their economy, but again, those were made in England and not in Maryland itself. Uh, we have a question, are the press types, hammer, rock, or screw mentioned in the legislation or charters? They're not. So all of that has been kind of uh, uncovered by numismatists in, throughout the years. Uh, there has been debate about that, uh, about this. Um, you know, some people actually say that the uh, willow trees, which were hammer, are, you know, believed to be hammer pressed, that they were actually struck on a rocker press, but now we believe that that's not necessarily the case. Um, uh, but no, no of the legislations uh, talk about this. Uh, it's all just through the evidence of the coins themselves. Uh, Gilles, I see you have a hand raised. Yes, um, so you, on one of your slides, uh, you uh, pointed to the fees uh, charged by the Mint. So uh, was paid 15 pence per 20 shillings truck plus one pence per ounce allowance for waste. So which is almost 8%. Uh, um, does it seem high to you? Because we, we have actually a force, you know, I'm, I'm moving 2000 years ago, we have a 4th century BC evidence from Delphi um, where the mint master to restrike the entire um, stock of, of silver coins that the, you know, the god Apollo uh, owned um, charged 2%. Mm, yeah, no, I do think it was high. I mean, he made, you know, a lot of times people get into your, you know, you know, try and get contracts to literally make money because they have the idea that they'll they'll actually become rich and most of the time it fails you know uh, but this was one of the few cases where he actually did make a lot of money during this and it's probably because of those those high fees you know eight percent is very high and that's why by the 1670s you have people you know his fee does get lowered a little bit and then by 1677 you have people who just want to abolish his fee altogether and it's most likely because they see him getting pretty darn wealthy from doing this, even though he did have other sources of income, but this was kind of the one that was in everyone's face. You know, he's making money and, and making a lot of money doing it. So that is high. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, any other questions, comments? Jesse, is it possible also that he was so, uh, you, he had to fee that high because he had no competitors? That's that could also be yeah yeah I mean you know they were and really I mean the it was unprecedented at the time it's not you know in this area there were there was never money made there before so um, you know what they were you know allowed to charge you know it, we don't know if they knew uh, you know what other mints were charging on the you know quarter way around the world you know maybe they thought that that was a decent amount uh, you know not too high and then. And then quickly or you know, eventually realized that uh, that it was it was too much. You know, not only did they not have competitors, but they didn't have any precedents for this in the past too. That's a good point, Dr. Brown. Any other questions? Uh, we have one, David Menchel. Any idea about die survival and how many coins were struck for each variety? Uh, die survival. Uh, I, if you mean, are there any dyes known today? There are not, uh, so so that's a zero. Uh, how many coins are struck for each variety? Um, I would probably say in the the low thousands, maybe ten thousand each. Uh, when Eric was here uh, cranking Miss Betsy, um, he let us know that they actually didn't have to harden uh, the dyes like we would traditionally think. So they weren't, it wasn't hardened dye steel, it was still soft and malleable um, because it was squeezed. It wasn't that percussive, you know, bang that could potentially shatter dyes. Uh, so once the dye wore down, they would actually just literally just re-engrave it and strengthen parts that needed re-engraving. Um, so, uh, so, you know, what could be traditionally um, expected on a, on a screw press was actually probably multiplied because they were using um, a, uh, a rocker press for, for a lot of these coins. So uh, that also, you know, it also depends on what coin you're talking about. So if you're talking about the oak and the pine tree, that, that could be one number, whereas you're talking about the, the 
small planchet pine tree, which was struck on a screw press, then that would be a different number. Uh, any other questions, comments? Um, I have a note here that there are very nice compliments for me in the comments, so I haven't been able to see them, but thank you all. I appreciate that. Uh, it's right. It's it's just a, at two o'clock now. So if, if there's any other dying pressing uh, questions that need to be answered right now, I'm more than happy to take one or two. But otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up.